In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about sharding's future, query optimization, replication read performance, and PostGIS. I'm Creston Jamieson, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 13. All right, our first blog post is built-in sharding for PostgreSQL, and this is from the Robert Haas blog. And in it, he talks about basically the future of sharding for PostgreSQL, the community version. Now, there's a couple of other solutions that allow you to do sharding today, such as um, Citus is something that I'm familiar with. Um, but this focuses on what core PostgreSQL is going to be doing for it. And this is a really great post, and I definitely suggest you read it. And even all of the linked content here, it's very interesting what they're thinking about and planning for the future. So I definitely suggest you review this. But basically, he talks about, uh, this is a quote, one way to look at sharding is as a form of partitioning. This is where you take a table, divide it into partitions, where the partitions might happen to be foreign tables rather than local tables. So foreign tables are basically ones that reside in another database. And there exists the technology today called a foreign data wrapper where you can communicate with other PostgreSQL databases or even Oracle or Redis or other databases, but basically use that concept to be able to push down uh, queries and directing inserts and updates to particular partitions using this foreign data wrapper technology, essentially. So he's basically saying the future's being paved, but it could be another year, couple of years, you know, maybe three years, don't really know, but that we keep getting closer to the point of where basically the core, the community PostgreSQL could support sharding using all the different features that have been builded upon with version 10 and version 11. So definitely a blog post to check out as well as each of these linked posts. And he talks about basically needing to do more push down into the essentially the partitioned databases when you're doing sharding. You're essentially partitioning the data to multiple databases. He talks about assuring ACID compliance when you're pushing down an update to a particular partition that it happens on a global scale that it's consistent. And also basically ease of use, how easy it is, is it to provision these multiple databases and managing them and have everything work in tandem. So again, definitely a blog post to check out for this week. The next blog post is Simple Tips for PostgreSQL Query Optimization. And the subline is How to Speed Up Your Database Performance 100-Fold. And this is part of the StatsBot blog. Now, now it is pretty simple. So they talk about um, some use cases where they added a date-based multi-column index and got 100-fold or they say 112-fold performance improvement. Definitely possible. I've seen much higher than that performance improvements with indexes, particularly, you know, partial indexes. But this is covering some information about multi-column indexes. They go over explain, analyze, and how you can use that to analyze exactly what the query is doing. Uh, talks about, at least from an analytical perspective, you may want to consider one, ind one index per query. Um, although with a transactional database, you want to minimize indexes and possibly try to use indexes that target more than one query. Um, but it basically, mostly what it covers is these multi-column indexes and talking about the order and how that's important and how it can not just affect, of course, the where clause, but also um, when you're doing, which is considered filtering, but also when you're joining two different tables, those indexes can be utilized as well as um, ordering. So definitely a blog post to check out if you want to get more up to speed on indexing. Although I will say this comment here where he says, quote, date columns are usually one of the best candidates for the first column in a multi-column index as it reduces scanning throughout in a predictable manner. And while as that can be the case, a lot of times there's plenty of instances I have encountered where using a different type of column and then following up with a date can give a lot better performance, particularly if you're um, ordering by things. But definitely a blog post to check out if you want to get more up to speed on this. 
The next post is how PostgreSQL analysis helped to gain 290 times performance boost for a particular request. And this is uh, on Medium by Oyulia Oletskaya, I believe. And in it, he talks about, it's basically a search query. So they're wanting to do a similar or a like search for to, across two different tables searching for something related to series and episodes by the name, so doing a partial search. Now, this is a little bit unique because they are actually using a CI text column, which is a case-insensitive text column, which basically performs a lower when it's storing the um, data. There's a reason why th these particular data types exist, but there's also some caveats in their use, and based upon their use case, they were getting sus sequential scans. They weren't able to use the index because they were using a trigram index. Now that might be a little bit familiar to you if you've seen the previous episodes where, excuse me, previous episode of Scaling Postgres where we were discussing uses of ORs. And it is possible to use a potentially a union with that. And he discusses different options that he has done trying to get better performance. Um, but because of the ORM they were using, they didn't want to go with the trying to do it using a union. So here he goes into the possible solution is to use SQL unions. So because of their ORM issue, they got some better performance, but they decided not to go that path. But what they ended up doing is actually storing, aggregating those two bits of data together, the episode name and the season name, into one column and one table to give a lot higher performance, of course, because you're no longer having to do joins and it can directly use a gen trigram index to get you very fast um, response times. So this blog post was an interesting examination because again, it's a Ruby developer. So it's a, from a developer's perspective of an issue he had to deal with and the business requirements that he had to work around in terms of case insensitivity and having an ORM that they really didn't want to have to work around and kind of a compromise solution he came up with for this problem. So another blog post to check out. The next blog post is high availability and scalable reads in PostgreSQL. And this is from the timescale.com blog. And in it, they, this is with a subtitle is a detailed primer on scaling PostgreSQL via streaming replication. So this is a pretty comprehensive blog post and it goes into kind of the why for replication, how it works in terms of synchronizing data from a primary to replica, how it works using wall files, essentially the write ahead log and distributing that to the different slaves by different mechanisms. I found this particular point very interesting where you're defining how you want to replicate the data. So there's basically three different options. One is asynchronous replication. In other words, you are going to send the data to the replica without waiting to see if it has confirmed that it's written or not. Now, each of these options has a balance. Asynchronous replication gives you the highest write performance. You don't have to wait to ensure that data has been written before returning to the application that something's been written to the master, for example. And also in terms of read consistency, this is classified as the weakest because it's eventually consistent across all your replicas. So it's committed on the master or the primary and eventually it'll get out to all the replicas. And the data loss is the highest risk because you know, have no guarantees that all the data was written to the replicas, of course. The next replication mode is write replication. That means data has been written to the wall files of the replicas, but not necessarily saved to the database. So it could exist in the wall file, so it's been logged and written to disk, but if you query that database, it has not updated the database yet. Now, the write performance on that is about a medium level because you just need to get the data on the disk on the replicas in the wall files, not necessarily in, in the database yet. Uh, the read consistency, it gets a little bit closer than, of course, asynchronous, but it's still not a strong guarantee of consistency. And there's definitely a lower risk of data loss because at least it's on the disk on the replicas. Now, the next replication mode is synchronous apply replication. And this is where you want the data to have been written and be present in the database of each of the replicas and be queryable. 
So this, the write performance will be the lowest because you have to wait for everything to be written to the database itself, not just the wall file. So it's going to have to update indexes and whatnot in each of the, each of the replicas. Now you have a strong consistency guarantee because everything is essentially committed all at once across all the databases. But again, that's part of what the, is the poor write performance, but it's definitely offers the lowest risk of any data loss. So this whole section was a really great review. And then finally, they go into measuring the performance impact of each of these modes. And of course, this is by Timescale DB, which is an extension of PostgreSQL that allows you to store time series data, basically allows you to accept fast inserts into specialized tables. And they're showing the performance difference from when you have no replication. When you add asynchronous replication, the performance drops by 1%. When you go to asynchronous write, it drops by up to 28%. And then when you have synchronous apply, where you're applying to all the replicas at once, essentially you've halved the performance of PostgreSQL by doing that. And then the next area of performance they measured is how well it scales. So they looked at like a three node server and they got an average improvement of 2.5. They looked at a five node and got about a 4.8 performance improvement. So this is, they're basically creating more replicas so that they can spread queries out to each of them. So that's very interesting, but there is one thing that they did that I think is different than what you may experience in real world conditions in that they are using, so for these performance measurements, they're this is a quote, we present performance for a hundred million row data set that does fit in memory. So everything is fitting in memory. And that means that you can be fully cached across them because all the data set fits within memory or among each of the replicas. In more real world conditions, I normally haven't seen that. Typically the database is much larger than the memory being used um, so the database hardly ever all fits in memory. The consequence of that is that you're not going to get a linear performance because depending upon the queries hitting each replica, they're going to cache different ones. So you, what you'll see is your cache hit rate drop. Maybe it hits 90%, maybe it hits 85% because different queries are hitting different replicas at each time. Now, the only way to ensure a linear increase in performance is if you actually had a tool or a mechanism to target the same queries hitting the same replica database. That way you can assure high cache hit rates for each of the replicas. So I don't think in real world conditions you will always see um, what it describes here, but definitely an interesting blog post to take a look at. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about Timescale DB, I presented um, in a previous episode of Scaling Postgres about Timescale DB, but there is also an, another presentation that's been recently posted on the uh, Hacka Labs YouTube channel, and it's called Rearchitecting a SQL Database for Time Series Data. And this was presented at the Data ENG Conf, I guess Data Engineering Conference in New York City in two, 2017. It's by Mike Friedman, which, who's the co-founder and CTO of Timescale DB. So again, this presentation goes over Timescale DB, what it is, essentially a PostgreSQL extension that allows you to get really high performance for time-related data being fed into PostgreSQL. So if you're not familiar with it, I definitely suggest you check out this uh, YouTube video so you can understand what potential benefits this may offer you. The next blog post is PostGIS for Managers. And this is a presentation by P. Ramsey of Carto.com. Now this is called PostGIS for Managers, I believe because he's essentially talking about people who may want to get their feet with, wet with PostGIS or they're already using an Oracle equivalent, I believe called Oracle Spatial, and how you could potentially migrate to using open source solutions such as PostgreSQL and their PostGIS support uh, as opposed to using something like Oracle Spatial solution. So he talks about the concept of support, how do you transition to it, some of the different features, feature parity with the Oracle solution. So if you're looking to get into G post GIS or if you're using it on another platform, this would definitely be a presentation to check out so you can see what the different capabilities are for it. And the last post is fun with SQL 
recursive CTEs in Postgres. And this is from the citusdata.com blog. And CTEs are basically common table expressions. Essentially, they're clauses with with that allows you to do essentially subqueries easier. But it also offers some additional capabilities. So you can use it for recursive calls, which can be used in cases where you have hierarchical storage of data in PostgreSQL. And he goes over some basics of, of how to use it and then also a more real world example of where you can use this where you're trying to pull all the different people that are managed by a particular person. So if you're unfamiliar with this capability and want to potentially add it to your toolkit, uh, this is a pretty short post, so I suggest you check it out. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get all the links to the content presented in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode, or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks. Thanks.